You're watching Swipe, coming up on this week's show. We meet the students hoping to become the next big thing in visual effects. 360 good reasons to watch this bit, how to film immersively. And we go primal in our games review with the latest game in the Far Cry series. Welcome to Swipe. This week we're at Escape Studios. It's an academy training people in visual effects, like the ones we see in the movies and video games and on TV shows. Those designers often amaze and entertain us, but unlike actors, you've probably never heard of them. Stu's been meeting the people, learning the craft. Hey ladies. Welcome to Visual Effects School. This is where students learn to become the next Sarah Bennett, Paul Norris, Mark Williams Ardington, or Andrew Whitehurst. Haven't heard of them? Well, no, neither had I. But they won Oscars last month for their work on Ex Machina, helping to turn actress Alicia Vikander into the android Ava. Mark Spevik teaches visual effects here. He's worked on big movies like Casino Royale. He says VFX work has an important relationship with technology. Our industry is absolutely tech-driven. That's what's caused the huge explosion in the last sort of 15 years. Um, at the high end, it's the movies that sort of developed the software, and that software became tools that were sold to public, which then made more money to generate in the movies. So we had the budgets to generate things like the Photoshop that you use today. I mean, that was written by one of the brothers of one of the guys that worked at ILM, the people that did Star Wars. So Photoshop is a product of the film industry. And we tend to drive that technology. So as soon as there's new advancements, we take advantage or we create those advancements to put them in the movies. Mark teaches skills like these seen here in this work by student Penelope. This is called compositing, combining filmed footage and all the different computer effects to make one smooth scene. If you think of uh, like one beautiful establishing shot from Game of Thrones, for example, where you have um, like a woman staring over a balcony and the scenery is just like beautiful, of course that doesn't exist and someone kind of paints it in and then the compositor puts it all together to make it look like she's actually there. Students like Penelope could go on to work in the movie industry on films you and I see in the cinema. One day they could be getting paid to make Iron Man fight the Hulk in The Avengers, like Steve from Industrial Light and Magic. I was making the Hulk buster look like he was actually there, you know, making sure that the light direction was correct, um, to some extent the, the kind of material aspects of his suit. Um, to make sure that it kind of blended in and gave you the right sort of reflections of, of what was actually going on in the scene. So it looked like they were, they were really there. You may not have thought about the job being done by visual effects artists in the movies, but that's kind of the point. If these people do their work well, you won't even notice. Stuart Duggan, Sky News. Stay with us, still to come, shooting virtual reality. I find out how students learn to film in 360. But first, here's a roundup of some of this week's tech news. YouTube's co-founder Steve Chen has launched a live streaming site for food lovers. NOM is a mix of professional chefs and people who just want to share their kitchen skills in their own shows. Good morning, everybody. Coming to you live from the NOM HQ. You can interact with the hosts of the NOMcast with two-way video chat. Who needs a personal trainer when you've got smart clothing to do the job instead? Enflux, a new project on Kickstarter, is fitness wear with embedded sensors that track your movements, giving you feedback on your performance as you work out. Here's a way to stay hydrated using your phone. Watero, said to be the world's first smartphone-connected countertop purification system, launched on Indiegogo this week. The makers say its linked app can even remind you when to have a drink. A device to stop you losing things, which also happens to be one of America's favourite lifestyle apps, has come to the UK. Tile is based around this little square that you can attach to, well, whatever you like, to keep track of it. You can also enlist other Tile users anywhere in the world to help you find your items if they come into range. Stick around for our games review, including Far Cry Primal and Star Fox Zero. Now, if you're a regular swipe viewer, you might have noticed that pretty much every week we seem to mention virtual reality. Well, it's a big deal at the moment. But while most of the hype has been around the user experience, here they teach students how to film in 360. And I went to meet one of the guest tutors. 
So this is a six camera, three and 360 GoPro rig. So these are consumer level GoPros, same you can buy in the shop, but on a specific mount for 360 VR filming. So six cameras, yes. and they all film at exactly the same time. Yes, yeah, six independent cameras, all looking in different directions, with some crossover between them. This is very cool, this could be its case. Yes, so we bring this because it looks cool and because it's used for robust shoots. So this is a shoot we did in June last year. This is at Le Mans in France, and this is us strapping this camera to the bonnet of a 200 mile per hour Nissan GTR. But this doesn't look very 360 to me. This is what's called equirectangular projection, which is where you have the poles at the top and the bottom are incredibly distorted. And this wraps around your head when you're in a headset so you can look around and look up and down. And that's because of all the cameras in there? Absolutely. So each of these individual bits is a specific part, is a specific camera. Now when our cameraman is filming us, like Tom is today, he can see exactly what he's filming through his viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Can you watch the action live as you're filming? You can and you can't. You can kind of watch back one camera, you can watch it back on Wi-Fi, but actually in scenarios like this, where you have a camera that's miles away, it's actually impossible. So you have to prepare and then hope for the best. So how long then does it take to go from filming on one of these to actually watching it back on a VR headset? So it can take anything from half a day to a couple of weeks for extensive long shoots. How long do you think it would be before we could watch entire movies on a VR headset? So I think virtual reality is better used for kind of 10 to 15 minute intense experiences, but certainly the professional level technology to make that happen will kind of be coming out summer, autumn this year. These guys are designing video games, which could one day be blockbuster titles. And now it's time for our game slot. This week, we've got mammoths, saber-toothed tigers and cavemen in Far Cry Primal. We've also got a few titles to look forward to over the coming months. Here's Steve. The latest instalment in Far Cry's series, Far Cry Primal, has been doing really well. Uh, it's been at the top of the charts for the last two weeks, but that's no doubt in part helped by the fact that the PC version came out a week later than the console versions. It's very much the gameplay we've come to expect from the series, although this time we're whisked all the way back to 10,000 BC, complete with saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths. Of course, there's no guns, but the developers have gone out of their way to make sure we've got a wide selection of weapons in our arsenal, whether that's basic things like clubs or spears, to more advanced things like the bow and arrow or the sting bombs, which are basically giant bags of bees, just like the ones we had in the Mesolithic era. It's had some criticism for being a bit too similar to other Ubisoft titles, things like Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, and of course, the other Far Cry games, but thankfully there's enough new stuff in this game to keep it fresh, and it's really nice to play a game that actually takes us to a different period in history too. Pokken Tournament is a game where characters from the Pokemon franchise battle each other in the style of the fighting game Tekken, although it's been softened a little bit to allow more casual gamers to start to enjoy that type of play. Because it's got that Pokemon element, you're able to use various techniques from that series, so that you can do things like Mega Evolutions, but also you can call in support Pokemon to help you and assist you with attack or defence. Both Tekken and Pokemon are obviously massive franchises, so it's really nice to see the two collide in this game, although I suspect that it's going to appeal more to a Pokemon audience. I don't think hardcore Tekken gamers are really that interested in a weaker challenge or more simplified control schemes. Of course, it was originally released all the way back last summer in the Japanese arcades, but finally, we're going to be getting our hands on it on the Wii U on March the 18th, and yes, of course, you can play as Pikachu. April 22nd is going to see the release, finally, of the next instalment in Nintendo's Star Fox franchise, Star Fox Zero. When we saw it back at E3 last year, we were a little bit concerned about the way they were using the gamepad second screen stuff. It felt more like an unhelpful gimmick than anything that was actually adding to the gameplay. Hopefully, by choosing to delay the game from its original launch date of November 2015, though, they'll have taken time to address those concerns a lot of people had about the way that tech was being implemented. Gameplay is going to be very similar to previous titles, and yes, Falco, Peppy and Slippy are all going to be there, whether you want them to be or not, but they're also trying to add new things to the mix, like the Gyro Wing, which is sort of a drone helicopter that drops a little robot who can then go and explore otherwise inaccessible tiny areas. Obviously, Star Fox is a massive franchise for Nintendo, so given the muted response the Wii U's had generally, and also the confusion over the company's future with all the rumours and mystery around the NX, it's really important they get this one right. Big game that everyone's got their eye on, though, of course, is Uncharted 4, A Thief's End. We were originally meant to see that in the holiday season last year, but it ended up getting pushed back to March, then in December pushed to April, and now we've had it pushed back again until May the 10th. 
Whereas with most developers, I'd probably be a little bit worried that this continual pushing back of the release date was a sign there was maybe problems with the game. When you've got Naughty Dog doing that, you just trust that they're doing everything they can to make sure that when that game finally ends up on the shelves, it's the best possible game it can be. And it's got a lot to live up to. Of course, the original franchise was arguably the most successful on the PS3, and The Last of Us really took things to the next level. Of course, this is a series that's all about that main solo campaign, but I actually got my hands on the open multiplayer test last weekend, and there is plenty to look forward to in that as well. If Naughty Dog can get this right, it's undoubtedly going to be a system seller. So for anybody who's still not made their mind up and moved over to the new generation, this could be the game that pushes everything fully in Sony's favour. So no pressure. Well, that's it for this week. Take a look at Sky News on mobile for all the latest tech stories. I'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.